Who are the heroes of this pandemic? Would you say it was doctors or nurses, or would you say it was the CEOs of major corporations? Because that's what some of them, the CEOs, believe. I'm serious. Last night on this show, we told you about the quote unquote obscene level of inequality around the world today. Well, not exactly around the world, just between 10 of the richest men on the planet and the rest of us. According to the latest Oxfam report, their wealth doubled during the pandemic, while at the same time, income inequality rose to a level where it now contributes to one death every four seconds because of poor medical care, hunger, violence, and climate change. But is all of this just correlation, or is there really causation? Are billionaires really responsible for things like mass hunger and violence and climate change? The author of a new book says it's an unequivocal yes. Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devoured the World, by the New York Times' global economics correspondent Peter Goodman, takes a deep look into how five billionaires in particular have, quote, plundered the world in ways so comprehensive as to be effectively invisible, and especially during the pandemic, and to the detriment of democracy. We've talked about it on the show before, what unchecked capitalism and the billionaires at its helm are doing to the global economy. But what makes Goodman's book so fascinating is that he also shows us how these men, often talked about as villains of the 21st century, really see themselves as the saviors. Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, for example, actually said, in the pandemic, it was CEOs in many, many cases who were the heroes. They're the ones who stepped forward with their resources, not for profit, but to save the world. Not for profit? Right. This inflated self-image isn't just a post-pandemic phenomenon. Here's a quick look at the men Goodman profiles. My number one stakeholders are my employees. I have to do what's right for my employees. I have to advocate on their behalf. Over the last rolling 12 months, we saw $450 billion in net flows. We make more uh, profit uh, in terms of return, which goes to pension funds to help workers uh, and policemen. Even with that, we had a 16 percent uh, revenue increase. Politicians and others uh, not they need to understand the value that big companies bring in and not demonize or vilify business. They actually had $45 billion in active flows, uh, uh, flows internationally, flows domestically. We're going to have, what, the best growth year we've ever had this year. And so next year will be pretty good, too. When you're making $15,000 a second during this pandemic, I think pretty good is an understatement. Joining me now to discuss his new book, Davos Man, and the most outrageous stories that he's uncovered is New York Times global economics correspondent Peter Goodman. Peter, welcome to the show. Congratulations on the book. It's not a Thank new you. thesis. It's not a new thesis that as billionaires are getting richer, income inequality is growing too. So tell our viewers what makes your take on this ongoing story different. What was the most startling thing you learned about how much power and influence any of these Davos men have? Well, that's a great question. I mean, it's true. We know about inequality and we know about the artifice of the World Economic Forum where these modern day robber barons congratulate themselves for saving the world. What we also know is that right before the pandemic in 2019, we had a lot of talk of so-called stakeholder capitalism. Benioff, who says he's the hero of the pandemic, was championing it. Larry Fink, now the world's largest asset manager, was saying that Milton Friedmanism is behind us. Companies are no longer just about delivering profit to shareholders. Now they're going to take care of the world's problems. They're going to run their companies for the benefit of society, communities, labor. And the pandemic was the first serious test. And it's really been an abject failure. It's really clear that stakeholder capitalism is just an elaborate public relations exercise. You know, I mean, Jeff Bezos makes enough money through Amazon as we're all stuck in our homes, if we're lucky enough to work from home, if we don't work at slaughterhouses or empty bedpans, you know, at, at senior citizens' homes. He makes enough money to blast himself into space and enjoy the view of Earth from space while his workers are left in warehouses with no paid sick leave, not by accident, but because Amazon has lobbied aggressively and without PPE, without medical gowns and, and hand sanitizer even and, and face masks while they're actually packaging these things for other people who can pay for them. And Bezos even says, after they fire the head of a, uh, a labor uprising, Christian Smalls, uh, says, well, you know, you guys are essential workers. You're doing the heroic work of saving other people's grandmothers. And Christian Smalls tells me, 
Actually, even that's not true. It's not like we changed the product mix to prioritize face masks and hand sanitizers. The way he put it, we're still selling sex toys and video games and all the same stuff that people buy when they're stuck at home. So it's clear that Bezos didn't prosper while his workers were not prospering. Prospering, he prospered because his workers were suffering, and that's the pattern that we've seen again and again in this pandemic. And Peter, you spent a lot of time around these men. Uh, there seems to be a huge difference between how you and many others understand how they've transformed our world and how they think they've changed the world. Is there some quality that you've noticed that's common among them, some personality characteristic or idiosyncrasy? Well, they love to tell their origin stories. You know, I mean, Steve Schwartzman, worth roughly $18 billion, you know, has multiple residences. I mean, he owns residences the way most of us own socks or spatulas, you know, and, and yet he'll tell you, I mean, if you, if you read his memoir, or if you look at his public speeches, he'll go on about how you know, he's just a middle-class kid from the suburbs of Philadelphia who worked in his dad's linen store, and he hasn't changed at all, yet, you know, somehow is able to employ lobbyists and accountants, you know, by the dozen, rewriting the tax code, finding tax cuts, figuring out ways to prevent paying taxes the way most of us must, because our incomes are, are fairly similar. Uh, Benioff, who, you know, is the one who says he's the hero of the pandemic, along with other CEOs, loves to talk about riding around in the car with his dad on Sunday when he was <laughs> running his his fabric store. I mean, th this is a pattern. Jamie Dimon, who basically grew up on Park Avenue, you know, never left an <laughs> eight square block area between his prestigious uh, all boys school where he wore a blue blazer and, you know, the blue bloods who worked on Wall Street who essentially raised him. Um, you know, he still talks about how he's just a member of a family that was reared in Queens, a place he uh, no doubt does not spend much time beyond perhaps occasionally passing through an airport, although he usually <laughs> flies private. And that doesn't apply. Just, just listening to you speak, Peter, I'm sure they're all falling over one another to buy copies of your book to read about you write about them. I'm sure they can't wait to see how you've described them on the page. In 2020, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had this to say about billionaires. Have a listen. So no one ever makes a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. hmm. You take a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Peter, you don't make a billion dollars. You take a billion dollars. Do you agree with that? Well, look, I'm not here to demonize these guys. These guys are smart, and they work hard, and they have good ideas. I mean, Bezos is a certifiable genius, and we all benefit from the convenience of Amazon. It's not an accident that so many people are eager to do business with this company that has actually revolutionized the way we shop. Uh, there are countless examples of this. The question is, what are the terms under which these businesses should operate, and what does the public get back for their part of the equation? Because none of these businesses exist without roads that are publicly built and publicly financed, universities yep. that churn out graduates who can code. The, the internet itself, the electrical grid. I mean, there's got to be a society. And at a certain point, you know, if all of the winnings are just going to a handful of people, then society breaks down because nobody believes in anything. And I don't think it's an accident. You know, you've spent a lot of time on your program talking about January 6th. You know, we can talk about the lack of vaccination rates in the U.S. and the crazy conspiracy theories that are preventing people from, from getting uh, vaccines into their bloodstream. It's not an accident that when you leave literally hundreds of millions of people in some of the wealthiest countries on earth just marinating in the economic uncertainty, insecurity, that they're going to develop some crazy ideas about what's really going on because they're not crazy yeah. to think that their needs don't matter very much to the people who run the country. They simply don't. Yeah. So it is true that, that this insurgency, this breakdown in society is a reflection of inequality. Yeah, I mean, there's always legitimate anger against the system, against the establishment, against the swamp. Obviously, in 2016, uh, it was misdirected, I think some of us would argue. Um, a common theme among billionaires, and you mentioned that, you know, the roads that are built to help them make their money, is their unwillingness to invest in those roads and pay their taxes. You highlight how they love giving charity, philanthropy, giving back. Back in November, Jeff Bezos donated, a, I think, $100 million to the Obama Presidential Foundation in Chicago. Mark Benioff uh, of Salesforce has donated towards fighting homelessness in San Francisco. I'm not saying these people aren't greedy, but they're also willing to part with large amounts of their own cash. 
but only on their own terms, right? Not when it comes to taxes. They'll do anything they can to avoid taxes, but if it's on their terms, they'll give away hundreds of millions. Oh, they love generosity. I mean, they love to show up and have themselves photographed, you know, in a wretched country where people's lives are made somewhat less wretched by their largesse. I mean, they, they love to put their names on buildings. And I think, you know, Benioff is a particularly complex case because I think he actually is a com genuinely compassionate guy who, in fact, probably saved lives by going and finding PPE in the middle of the pandemic. He pulled strings with his contacts in China, had PPE flown to the States, distributed to frontline medical workers. Hey, that's great. But the question is, why are we dependent upon crumbs from the wealthiest people in the world yes, in the wealthiest exactly. country on earth in the middle of a pandemic. And, and as you correctly point out, it's always unilateral. This is the thing about stakeholder capitalism. You know, one stakeholder always gets left out, the government. Another is labor unions. Yeah, I mean, today, Larry Fink has this letter. Larry Fink writes a letter every year uh, to shareholders, uh, using it as an opportunity to talk about the great transformation in business and how, you know, if businesses don't do social good, then they're going to be swept aside. And it's he's just acting as a fiduciary to companies and counseling them. Well, OK. He talks about how you have to be nice to your employees. He goes on and on about how the pandemic has shown us that you have, we need things like, you know, home, uh, work-life balance uh, to be, we need to understand when people are sick and, you know, all that's great. But where are the rules? Where are the unions? I mean, all this stuff is just given as if it's a gift from, from wealthy people. That can be taken away. Yeah, it can be taken away. And this is, the, this is the problem of, as you say, why should we depend on crumbs? It's a, it's a fundamental question. I have no problem with billionaires being generous, but I would also like them to pay their taxes. Taxes decided by the rest of us, by society as a whole. Uh, and that's the problem. They kind of float above society. Uh, and that's why you call them Davos men. Uh, the book is fantastic. I urge readers, uh, viewers, to get a copy and become readers of it. Peter Goodman, thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.